Hello everybody, this is Jörg Lissmann once again from YouTube channel Dr. 66. I've decided not only to upload the broadcast that we did on Nothing But The Truth talk show on the 1st of January 2015, which deals with the subject of Plato's Cave, with you, which you will listen to uh, in a few moments. But before that, I've decided to take a little audio record taken from a uh, YouTube documentary that is called Prophecy Countdown, Agenda for the SDA Conference Church, Part 5. Now, this is a video I would really uh, advise everybody to watch, not only Part 5, but uh, all the parts. And it has nothing to do with uh, being a Seventh-day Adventist, but this uh, documentary goes about how the Jesuits, in which way they infiltrate not only the SDA Church, but all of the uh, other denominations also, because, you know, all denominations are today ruled by the Jesuits, more or less, uh, in the most cases even more. So that's why I think this little audio will give you a little insight of uh, what Plato's Cave is really all about. And then, of course, I will provide the link to the Prophecy Countdown documentary, which is more than four hours long, uh, in the description box of the video that you can have a look afterwards. So. You can now enjoy a little intro from Prophecy Countdown, from um, the two persons there. And these two persons are Pastor John Osborne with the special guest Top Treffs. And he exposes the Jesuit plot to infiltrate the churches under the General Convention. So this is just speaking about the SDA. But um, just eliminate the words SDA from the whole program and put in all other Protestant denominations you have over there in the United States and um, you can count that for all of it. The Jesuits always act the same way. So by that I hope you uh, will enjoy our reading and studying of Plato's Cave and keep in mind what uh, John Osborne and Bob Treffs say before that and I will introduce him to them right here. So enjoy and learn. God bless you. Bye bye. and they merely plugged in the term British Empire where Roman Catholic Church was. Mm. Now, as we trace down what has happened in time, it was this organization that established the Council on Foreign Relations as a front group here for its purposes in America and other front groups all over a network. And we see that the Council on Foreign Relations and Trilateral Commission and Bilderbergers mm -hmm. all working for a one world government. Mm -hmm. Now, Quigley, in his massive book here, Tragedy and Hope, tells us of how he studied this secret society for 20 years and he had access to their top secret records for two years and he tells of how they worked with the communists how they were uh, facilitating communist influence here in america and how the whole thing is uh, resting upon the attempt to control all the nations through finance and here is a review of of tragedy and hope by w cleon scoos the naked capitalist and in this book, Skuzin goes behind the scenes and he goes to the professor that inspired Cecil Rhodes to start all of this. And that professor's name was Ruskin. And Ruskin, when he came to Oxford University, they, they said it was like an earthquake struck the university. He made such an impact. And he promoted the idea from Plato's Republic of an elite group of men controlling the masses that would be subservient to them. And this is what got into Cecil Rhodes' yes. mind. And every major dictator in the 20th century has, including Marx's ideas, Marx studied the Republic, this has been the pattern which all of the dictators of the 20th century yes, have patterned upon. Incredible. And you see, the uh, Plato was an ancient Greek philosopher, and Roman Catholic theology is all intertwined and enmeshed with Platonic philosophy and Aristotle's philosophy. Talk Recorded live. Hello, this is Michael Adams from Nothing But the Truth. Once again, it's January 1st, 2015, and we're having another episode today. Uh, previously, we were discussing Daniel's 70th week, uh, Daniel 9, 
uh, verses 23 through 27. And now we're going to go, <laughs> I guess, more into the worldly of things here. Uh, we're going to discuss Plato, uh, the allegory of the cave. And uh, Jorg from Juggler 66 uh, uh, is going to lead the discussion. Tom Fress has stayed along with us. Anybody else who would like to join in, they certainly can. Um, Jorg, how are we doing again? Long time no see, <laughs> or here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just have had time to uh, pick up my jaws that dropped during, uh, during Tom's broadcast to the ground. So um, now that I have it back, I can do some reading. Um, and, you know, I, um, I'm not so much into the world anymore, okay, but I really like this um, allegory of the cave from Plato um, because it gives the people a little bit of an insight in what kind of system that we are living in. Um, there have been movies made about that. Uh, to my knowledge, the first movie that showed a little bit of kind of the matrix that we are living in is what's the, the movie by John Carpenter from the 80s, called They Live. Yep. Of course, that movie had another twist because it deals with an alien agenda. And then, of course, you have this famous Matrix movies, uh, I think started in 1999 with uh, number one, um, where there were many leads to 9-11, for example, when you look at um, the passport of Leo that expires uh, September 11, 2001. What a coincidence when he is in interrogated by the police there and things like this. But these movies have, for some people at least, opened their eyes that life as shown to us is not the life as it really is. Now, of course, when you are a Christian and you study the Bible and you understand the Bible, then you know that we are living in the world of materialism and in this world, so-called, that is nothing like the world of God, of course. But a lot of people who are not Christian, and there are, that's a shame to say, but that's the fact, there are a lot of people today, and there aren't any Christians, um, they often do not understand that we are living uh, like people who are sitting in a theater and just looking at a podium and looking at the things happening before us. And when they see them, they only say, oh, well, I'm just sitting here, I can't do anything about it anyways. And um, I stumbled upon Plato's Cave a year or two ago, I don't know, uh, it's something more than a year. And um, when I had a very regular uh, fellowship with Walt Sticker from Grand Design Exposed, I told him five or six times during a few months that he should read the allegory of the cave, and he never came to it. And the funny thing was, when he finally came to it, he called me up and he said, wow, why in the hell didn't I read that earlier? Now I understand what you were talking about. <laughs> and um, this is a little bit um, the reason that I asked Michael today to do the show on Plato's Cave. It won't take much, uh, much of time. But I'm very glad that we have still Tom Fress with us. And um, uh, like I said in the beginning, I, I, I'd like you whether to interrupt me when there's something that you have a remark on uh, while I'm reading or just put questions in the chat box <clears throat> that I can go into that, of course. Um, I will first start with a little explanation for the people who are not familiar with who Plato is, um, because this is uh, very interesting. Uh, Plato wrote a book that is called The Republic, so this should speak to maybe some Americans at least, because they are supposedly living in the Republic, even though there is not of that Republic left today anymore. And um, what does Wikipedia state on Plato? Plato um, lived between the time of 428 to uh, 348 before Christ. So that's about almost 2,400 years ago. He was a philosopher as well as a mathematician in classical Greece and an influential figure in philosophy, Central Western philosophy. He was Socrates' student and founded the Academy in Athens, the first institution of higher learning in the Western world. Along with Socrates and his most famous student, Aristotle, Plato helped to lay the foundations of Western philosophy and science. Alfred North Whitehead once noted, the safest general characterization of the European philosophical tradition is 
than it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. Plato's dialogues have been used to teach a range of subjects, including philosophy, logic, ethics, rhetoric, religion, and mathematics. His theory of forms began a unique perspective on abstract objects and led to a school of thought called Platonism. Plato's writings have been published in several fashions. His has, this has led to several conventions regarding the naming and refer referencing of Plato's texts. This is end quote from Wikipedia. And what you probably still got from this reading is I said that he was uh, teaching in philosophy, logic, ethics, rhetoric, mathematics. And um, you have to understand, of course, philosophy, that is the study of men. So I call him the founder of humanism, the founder of the study of man, which has nothing to do with the study of God or the world of God, of course. And that's where this broadcast is, of course, a little bit different than all the other broadcasts that have been here on Nothing But The Truth talk show radio. But I think that it is very important, and, uh, well, you can whether agree with me or disagree with me when you heard Plato's Cave reading, and then we will see what it's all about. But initially, I'm just going to ask uh, Tom, Michael, do you have any remarks on that what I just read and about the... Uh, let's call it constitution of Plato being a humanist and not teaching God's word, but man's word. Yes. I have, I have a comment about it and we need to, you pointed it out. I just want to emphasize that philosophy is simply the study of the mind of man. Philosophy comes from man's own wisdom. It is not derived from the scripture. The Bible says the human heart, that is the human mind, is desperately wicked. Who can know it? So wisdom, we know from the Scripture, only comes from the Scripture. Now Plato was outside of the commonwealth of Israel. He was outside of the wisdom of the Scripture. He was a Gentile. He was a, a, a Greek philosopher. Remember Daniel's prophecy that would be four Gentile empires before Christ's return, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek, and then the Roman. And Plato was a well-renowned philosopher who studied the wickedness of man's mind, philosophy and became renowned for his so-called wisdom that was completely outside of the scriptures. And this writing of his, The Republic, is a demonstration of the depravity that comes to the wicked heart of man. Absent any knowledge from the scriptures, and the reading of this work will, dis, will, will show us in vivid detail what the wickedness of man mind, man's mind will produce without the knowledge of God. Go ahead, uh, Yerk. Okay, thanks, Tom. So Plato wrote a book called The Republic, and in Book 7 of The Republic, he wrote The Allegory of the Cave. The allegory of the cave is uh, a little bit of explanation, and for the rest it is a conversation between uh, Socrates, who is speaking with Glaucon. I'm going to read this uh, right now, so I'm going to start here. Quote, here's a little story from Plato's most famous book, The Republic. Socrates is talking to a young follower of his name, uh, of his name to Glaucon and is telling him this fable to illustrate what it's like to be a philosopher, a lover of wisdom. Most people, including ourselves, live in a world of relative ignorance. We are even comfortable with that ignorance because it is all we know. When we first start facing truths, the process may be frightening, and many people run back to their old lives. But if you continue to seek truths, you will eventually be able to handle it better. In fact, you want more. 
it's true that many people around you now may think you are weird or even dangerous to society, but you don't care. Once you've tasted the truth, you won't ever go back to being ignorant. Well, I have to stop reading here right now and tell you, well, that's the same when you discover the Bible, because that is the real truth and not the truth of uh, Socrates or or Plato, right? Okay, continuing. Socrates is speaking with Glaucon. Socrates, quote, And now, I said, let me show in a figure how far our nature is enlightened or unenlightened. Behold, human beings living in the underground den which has a mouth open towards the light and reaching all along the den. Here they have been from their childhood and have their legs and necks chained so that they cannot move and can only see before them, being prevented by the chains from turning round their necks. Above and behind them, the fire is blazing at a distance, and between the fire and the prisoners, there is a raised way. And you will see, if you look, a low wall put along the way, like the screen which marionette players have in front of them, over which they show the puppets. Glocken replies, I see. Socrates, and do you see, I said, men passing along the wall carrying all sorts of vessels and statues and figures of animals made of wood and stone and various materials which appear all over the wall? Some of them are talking, others are silent. Glauken, you have shown me a strange image, and they are strange prisoners. Socrates, like ourselves, I replied, and they see only their own shadows, or the shadows of one another, which the fire throws on the opposite wall of the cave. True, he said. How could they see anything but the shadows if they were never allowed to move their heads? And of the objects which are being carried in like manner, they would only see the shadows? Yes said. And if they were able to converse with one another, would they not suppose that they were naming what was actually before them? That's very true. And suppose further that the prison had an echo which came from the other side, would they not be sure to fancy when one of the passers-by spoke that the voice which they heard came from the passing shadow? No question, he replied. To them, I said, the truth would be literally nothing but the shadows of the images. That is certain. And now look again and see what will naturally follow if the prisoners are released and disabused for, of their error. At first, when any of them is liberated and compelled suddenly to stand up and turn his neck around and walk and look for, towards the light, he will suffer sharp pains. The glare will distress him and he will be unable to see the realities of which his former state he had seen the shadows. And then conceive some, someone saying to him um, that what he was before was an illusion, but what now, when he is approaching nearer to being uh, and his eye is turned towards more real existence, he has a clearer vision, what will be his reply? And you may further imagine that this instructor is pointing to the objects as they pass and requiring him to name them. Will he not be perplexed? Will he not fancy that the shadows uh, which he formerly saw are truer than the objects which are shown now to him? Far truer. And if he is compelled to look straight at the light, will he not have a pain in his eyes which will make him turn away to take and take, which will turn away to take and take the objects of vision which he can see and which he will conceive to be in reality clearer than the things which are now being shown to him? Very true, he said. And suppose once more that he is reluctantly dragged up and steep and rugged ascent and held fast until he is forced into the presence of the sun himself. He, is he not likely to be painted and, uh, pained and irritated? When he approaches the light, his eyes will be dazzled and he will not be able to see anything at all of what are now called realities. Reply, not all in a moment, he said. He will require to grow accustomed to the sight of the upper world, and first he will see the shadows best next to reflections of men and other objects in the water, and then the objects themselves, 
Then he will gaze upon the light of the moon and the stars and the sprangled heaven. And he will see the sky and the stars by night better than the sun or the light of the sun by day? Certainly. Lost, he will be able to, be see, to see the sun and not mere reflections of him in the water, but he will see him in his own proper place and not in another, and he will contemplate him as he is. Certainly. He will then proceed to argue that this is who he gives the, re, the sea, uh, that this is he who gives the season of the years and is the guardian of all that is in the visible world and in a certain way the cause of all things which he and his fellows have been accustomed to behold. Clearly, he said, he would first see the sun and then reason about him. And when he remembered his old habitation and the wisdom of the den and his fellow prisoners, do you not suppose that he would uh, felicitate himself on the change and pity them? Certainly he would. And if they were in the habit of conferring honors among themselves and those who were quickest to observe the passing shadows and to remark which of them went before and which followed after and which were together and who were, for, and who were therefore best able to draw conclusions as to the future, do you think that he would care for such honors and glories or envy the uh, possessors of them. Would he not say with, uh, with Homer, quote, better to, be poor, uh, better to be the poor servant of a poor master and to endure anything rather than think as they do and live after their manner, end quote. Yes, he said, I think that he would rather suffer anything than uh, entertain these false notions and live in this miserable manner. Imagine once more I said, such and one coming suddenly, uh, such and one coming suddenly out of the sun to be replaced in his old situation, would he not be certain to have his eyes full of darkness? To be sure, he said. And if there were a contest, and he had to compete in measuring the shadows with the prisoners who had never moved out of the den, while his sight was still weak, and before his eyes had become steady, and the time which would be needed to acquire this new habit of sight might be very considerable, would he not be ridiculous? Men would say of him that up he went and down he came without his eyes, and that it was better not even to think of ascending. And if anyone tried to lose another and lead him up to the light, let him only catch the offender, and they would, would put him to death. No question, he said. This entire allegory, I said, you may now append, dear Glocken, to the previous moment argument. The prison house is the world of sight. The light of the fire is the sun. And you will not misapprehend me if you interpret the journey upwards to be the ascent of the soul into the intellectual world according to my poor belief, which, at your desire, I have expressed whether rightly or wrongly, God knows. But whether true or false, my opinion is that in the world of knowledge, the idea of good appears last, uh, uh, last of all, and it is seen only with an effort, and, when seen, is also inferred to be the universal author of all things beautiful and right, parent of light and of the Lord of light and this visible world, and the immediate source of reason and truth in the intellectual, and that is the, uh, the power upon which we would act rationally, either in public or private life, uh, uh, private life must have his eye fixed. End quote from the reading. So I'm not sure if that was clear to everybody who listened here because uh, you, um, uh, you just follow the reading, of course, to have a better understanding of this. But the way that I understand it and the way that I understood it from the beginning, that is that we are also taught to view the world in a certain view. And to get that view, we are pressed into an education system that is not an education system, but an indoctrination system, to indoctrinate us with the view that, that we have to have on certain things. And therefore, they pass laws and pass humanism on us and say human rights and peace and love 
and knowledge, which is all more important than the wisdom that can be gotten from Scripture, that they are all going to take out of us. And they are going to play a theater before us. And one of the most important platforms of this theater today is, of course, the television. While it was started as an entertainment, it has become really a family altar. It has become an alternate religion, the television. And there are people today who believe just anything as long as it was shown on television. One of the best examples that I could think of right now is the broadcast of 9-11-2001. It is because I saw it happen on television that it is real, that it happened. This allegory may be two and a half thousand years almost old, but it absolutely deals with the world that we are living in today. We are chained to the ground like the people in the cave. We are taught not to look left, not to look right, and not to look back, only to look ahead to what the figures are playing for us and to take for granted that that's what is to us presented as, as the truth in this matrix system we are living in, that is the truth, and not even to question it, and not go to turn around and look for the source of light. And, of course, the source of light is God, and is the Bible. That is what can open our eyes. That's the way that I understand it, but now people have listened to my voice long enough, so I'd like to hear Tom or Michael on this now. Well, like you, it, it's difficult for someone on the outside uh, who doesn't have this text in front of them to follow along. But what Plato has described is a cave with light shining in from the entrance and shining upon the back wall of the cage uh, of the cave. And the people are chained to the floor of the cave with their backs toward the opening of, of the cave, their backs toward the light, and they're facing the back wall of the cave. And the only thing that they can see, they can't see themselves, they can't see their neighbors, all they can see is the back wall of the cave and the, and the diffuse light shining on the backside of the cave from the opening or from the fire that is burning behind them. And then there are images, shadows, that pass between their backs and the fire, uh, real items, real people, <clears throat> real events passing behind them in front of the fire and their reflections shining on the back of the cave. So the slaves who are chained to the, to, the, to the floor of the cave with their backs toward the light and with their backs toward reality are only allowed to see the shadows on the, on the wall. Think of the back wall of the cave as a projector screen. And uh, we've all played hand puppets where we have a light behind our hand that reflects a, a diffuse light on the wall, and then our hand between the flame and the wall making shadow puppets. Okay, we've all played that little game. We were taught that in school. This comes from Plato's Republic. So the people that are chained to the cave are you and me, the populace of the world. And all we get to see are shadows that's our reality we're not allowed to see what's behind us the press keeps that uh, secret the rulers of the world keep reality secret and all we are allowed to see are the passing shadows moving back and forth across the back of the cave uh, uh, in, uh, on the on the projector screen in front of our faces. We're not allowed to see ourselves. We're not allowed to see our neighbors. We're, our attention is only focused on the projector screen 
or the back wall of the cave, and reality happens behind our backs. Now, if we are satisfied with our lot in life and do not break our chains and do not turn around to face the, the, the flame and to see the stage of real people and events taking place, then we are stuck in this apparent reality that's nothing but types and shadows. But say one of us decides to break our chains, to stand up, to turn around, and actually see the real action that's taking place behind us, to turn around and see the events of history, see the real characters of the world moving back and forth in the stage, and realize that we're now not looking at mere shadows, but real events, real people. The first thing Plato says, first of all, he would be blinded by the light. And it would take a long time for his eyes to adjust to this new illumination. And then he would have to come to grips with the reality that all he ever knew before were just types and shadows as real as they may have seemed to him. They pale in comparison to the reality that has been taking place behind his back the entire time. And many of the people who might be motivated to break their chains, free themselves from the floor of the cave, free their eyes from gazing upon types and shadows being cast upon the back of their prison, and stand up and turn around and look at reality. Most of them, virtually all of them, would just as soon turn around and refasten themselves to the to the to the, the the chains of the cave and resume looking at mere types and shadows. That reality would be beyond their comprehension, would horrify them, and they would just as soon return to being a slave looking at mere types and shadows. And isn't that what we see in the world today? When we come, when we decided to free ourselves from the chains to which we are all fastened at birth, indoctrinated by by the press, indoctrinated by the schools, indoctrinated by all the types and shadows, to stand up and turn around and look at the reality that's taking place behind us, Most of us decide that it's too much for us to handle, and we just enslave ourselves once again and return to the back of the cave. And that's the the guarantee that the rulers of the world, the wise, the ones that the world calls the wise, are so easily, are so able to, to so easily deceive and control the perceptions of the masses. This, 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 This uh, story of the cave shows us precisely how the ruling class, I mean, we're led to call them the rich ruling elite, how they control us. And it's only if we break loose from our chains, stand up and turn around and examine the world the way it really is, not the way it's projected on the screen, but the way it really is, then we might free ourselves. But most of us are blinded by the light. You know, uh, Jack Nicholas plainly said, you can't handle the truth. The masses cannot handle the truth. And Plato knew this. And by this demonstration, uh, this little allegory of, of the cave, the allegory of the cave is simply a small pictorial demonstration of how the wicked rule this world. And it would all be for naught if the people would just stand up, break loose of their chains, break loose of their indoctrination, 
turn around and look at the real players on the stage, then their eyes would truly be opened. And I believe, unlike Plato in this case, that seeing the light is in the Scriptures, the light of Christ. The Bible says, not many wise shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Who's he talking about? the rich ruling elite that are standing on the stage behind it, between the light and the back of the wall of the cave, passing these images, casting these images on the wall, deceiving the people, indoctrinating the people, robbing them of their humanity, robbing them of their wealth, robbing them of, of any true knowledge, putting forward a false reality that is only a, 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 a it, that is only a, a, a type and a shadow of what's really happening in the world. Not many of those wise will enter the kingdom of heaven because they've deceived God's people. They've made merchandise of God's people. They've enslaved God's people. They've turned them away from the light and into the darkness. And Plato is simply studied by the rich ruling elite so that they might learn how to control the world and to subjugate God's people. But we're free from our chains if we pick up the Bible and see the light of Christ and the liberty whereby Christ hath made us free, and then turn around and expose the false light coming from this false fire on the back wall of the cave, of the cave and these phonies these philosophers, these demons passing back and forth on the stage, casting their phony shadows upon the wall to deceive us. Not only is this a depiction of how the quote-unquote rich ruling elite deceive the world, but it also has the answer. We have to stand up and turn around and face the light and face these demons passing back and forth on the stage, casting shadows on the wall. How am I doing? Yeah, that was a very interesting point. You know, we have to realize that we are living in an illusion, in an illusion that is presented to us, like the rulers of the world want us to see the world, that is the way that we have to see it. And uh, I found a very interesting quote from someone you both know. Uh, He's uh, a knight of Malta and a high Freemason called Henry Kissinger. And he said, quote, It is not a matter of what is true that counts, but a matter of what is perceived to be true. Indeed. And therefore, therefore, people have to be taught what they perceive to be true. Whatever they teach, and that starts from kindergarten when you're a few years old on, and goes into the whole indoctrination system called school and university, whatever they teach you there, that is perceived to be true. And then the people will stop asking questions. And that's the place that we are right now. Uh, Tom, you made another quote about uh, they made people uh, some kind of an asset, right? To make merchandise of God's people. Yeah, merchandise of God's people, yeah. Um, A very good example of how that is, is today you have in every big company a department that is called human resources. That's right. Just think about this term, a human resource. You're not even a person anymore. You are just a resource that can be used for whatever goal the people who use you want to use you. And they can show you whatever reality they want to and make it real by repeating it and repeating it and repeating it. And as we all know, A lie repeated a thousand times is much more believed than the truth told once. 
Yes, uh, this, uh, you know, we are indoctrinated from cradle to grave to see one another and ourselves as a human resource. Isn't that a far cry from being joint heirs with Christ? God said, the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. And Christ is his heir, and we are joint heirs with him. So what does that mean? We will inherit the earth and the fullness thereof. But we are faced to sit in the back of the cave with our back toward our inheritance and only allowed to enjoy types and shadows on the back of the wall. No liberty no reality of our true inheritance. That's what human philosophy produces. That's what Plato produced. We have moved from joint heirs with Christ to mere human resources for the wise those who are well-read in the philosophies of men, the wicked hearts of uh, unregenerate man, those who are considered to be the intellectual elite in the world, like Henry Kissinger. That's how he views us, but only until we break our chains, stand up, and receive our inheritance, then they become the ignorant. Very well said, Tom. Um, I don't have much more to, to add to this, but I think Michael has something else to add about Demiurge, if I pronounce that right. Michael? Well, yeah, if you look at uh, Plato, let me go back to this. First of all, there's a couple of things I would like to trust. First of all, when you look at the very first paragraph he's talking about, he says, but if you continue to seek truth, this is men's wisdom now, you will eventually be able to handle it better. In fact, you will want more. That's a fine definition of Gnosticism or, you know, those learning, well, we also know through the Jesuits, learning against learning, constantly learning, learning, learning more of men's knowledge. But if you look at, you know, a fundamental question that needs to be raised in this uh, little story is, you know, towards the end, Plato talks about God. And let me, uh, let me read part of that. It's the last paragraph of that. It says, I... Do, 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 do. Let's see. I have expressed whether rightly or wrongly, God knows. Right. So he asked, he must ask the question, uh, who's Plato God? That's the question. He, Remember, he was outside the commonwealth of Christ. He was outside the nation of Israel. The Bible was not his book of wisdom. It was simply the study of the, the wicked heart of man, the philosophies of men. That's what Plato was all about. So, so that, what God... So what God what God was Plato referring to? So that, that's where I just send you to jump in. Uh, how do you say that word again, York? How did you pronounce it? Demiurge. 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 I would call it Demiurge. But, uh, mm-hmm. uh, anyways, this is Plato's God. And you're gonna, if you read this, you're going to realize that Plato's God is Plato. He's God. And men like him, they're God. They're the gods. And they are the ones that will rule and control uh, the common people, the the profane, if you will, which is not really one of his words. But but if you look at it, if you read that first couple of paragraphs uh, from Wikipedia, it talks about that. You know, the Demiurge is the fashioner of the real, perceivable world after the model of the ideas, 
and this is but and then brackets in most uh, neoplatonic systems is still not itself and then you go through this whole thing you better break it all down but it's an ideology of the uh, various Gnostic systems humanists you talked about early humanists about men now then you got to ask yourself is it about all men or a certain group of men and you realize that Plato and Socrates were not talking about the average Joe on the street. They were talking about the ruling class, who's always been the ruling class. Well, it's been the politicians, it's been the, the military, the soldiers, it's been the priest class. There you go, the priestly class. Right. So they're the, this, he's talking about them, but they are going to be the artist and like figures responsible in fashioning and maintaining and maintenance of the physical world. That they are the gods. They are God. And uh, it's, it's an important thing. You know, when I first read uh, the allegory of the cave a couple years ago, before, you know, uh, I surrendered to and accepted my Lord and Savior to be Jesus Christ and accepted the Bible, if this, the, this uh, analogy or allegory had a different meaning. Today, it has a, a much more significant meaning <laughs> than it ever did back then. Back then, it sounded like something like, wow, you know, I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm, I'm really starting to wake up to how the world really works, you know. Uh, but it was all about me, how I could understand the world, how I could control it, how I could make change it, uh, how I could be basically a little mini-god. I didn't recognize at the time I wasn't thinking that way, but looking back now, like so many others, I was just playing God through this philosophy, vain philosophy of men. I mean, the more you study Plato, the more you realize how it really is about the elite, the ruling class, the people that are going to control the rest of us. It has nothing to do with you and me. They don't care about you and I. They don't care it's about, all the about them. It's it all is. about them. And what seems to be all these people, including myself one time, were quoting Plato. Now I look at it like... I, I, I would be a fool to quote Plato, a man in my position, and not only that, not my own earthly position, but the fact that I actually believe in a God. I believe in God. <laughs> Why would I quote Plato? So it's interesting to, to, to read this now because you know, you look at this, like even the drawing itself, you know, it's like these guys chained in a, in a, in a cave and there's, you know, backs against the fire and all that. But, uh, you know, has things really changed that much at all in 2,000 years? I mean, put a television there instead of that. You know, put a, a living room with a couch and a computer and a television, and you're almost in the same situation again, right? It's just a different. There's technology now. You know, I don't know. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Well, the well, technology has changed, but the play is still the same. Absolutely, nothing's changed as far as the, what is significant, what matters. <laughs> isn't, isn't, it interest, isn't it interesting that Plato had this view of it already two and a half thousand years from here, without even probably knowing uh, anything of the Bible, um, that he has had this, this view, that when today you explain it the way that we are trying to explain it to all our listeners here in this broadcast, that they will see that they are actually just living an illusion that is given to them to please the rulers of these worlds. Because they are afraid. Because if we, like he stated in the beginning, um, when you seek the truth, when you seek the truth, you continue to seek the truth, and you will eventually, uh, eventually able to handle it better. In fact, you want more. That's what I always said when I discovered the Bible, the Word of God. And I said, I, I don't want to stop reading this anymore. All right, but Plato, you and I come to that by the grace of God, but Plato's not talking about that. He's talking about earthly, worldly, manly wisdom and about being part of the ruling class, if you will, that, you know, if you look at, you know, we Rome today, it was Babylon back then and everything in between, you know, it's, it, this is, he is just defining to us how the ruling class actually controls the masses. I, I, I see it. I agree with you, but there's, there's one point that I have to make, and that has to do with my story of how I found the truth and how, how I found Jesus. 
when I first studied or started to study the New World Order by going, digging a little bit deeper into the facts of 9-11, which were presented to me in a way that I thought, okay, this photo was well. I saw it on TV, so I believe it, and I never asked questions about it. So when I was <clears throat> turned by a friend to, well, don't believe everything they say, just look a little bit this up, I wasn't seeking Jesus in that. I was just looking for who is ruling the world that I came to that. And the deeper I studied, the more I understood on the one hand, and the more I was confused on the other. But by falling into videos that were made on the Vatican and the Jesuits, I started to understand. And by that, I started to seek the Lord. Oh, yeah, I understand. By the so grace of God. You mean, that, you mean Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Okay? He is the truth. He is the only truth. But there are many ways that lead to the truth when you are in this cave, uh, bound like these people are, like, like we are in this system. There are many people who try to seek the truth. Many, of course, will never find the real truth like you do when you find the Bible and when you find Jesus and when you accept Jesus as your Savior. But still people are trying to, to get away. But to make that step from this worldly truth that is presented by doing certain studies of these and to really find the spiritual truth that is presented by our Lord and Savior, that's a different. And that is not a step that everybody makes. No, or nor, you know, you and I had a very the same journey so but i can say that for most for many people they don't have to go through our journey it just you know because of our makeup we need to go through that but the big thing is when you look at this journey of searching for the truth and you say that many people can't find it i argue that actually many people do find it but don't accept it in other words oh, yeah, most right. people do, do they don't accept the bible they don't accept jesus christ no, they, they, because they, they still want to they have a look at it and they turn back to the case because they're safe yeah, they found, they found the answer, but they don't want to accept it. That's and right. they want to play, still play God, and they still want to be little Plato's. And, you know, we'll just keep on. I, I, was, I know because I was that person. I kept on chasing, going, you know, they say going down you know, rabbit holes or yeah, running trails. trails. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I was doing that, and I did everything but reopen up that Bible and accept Jesus. I tried everything, I'm telling you. I tried everything to avoid the truth. The irony of what Plato is actually teaching is, is teaching men how to actually avoid the truth. That's the reality. He's actually teaching that. He's not teaching people to find truth, wisdom, you know, that, but, but your own wisdom, your own truth, man's truth. And he's very deceptive. And, and he's, it's something that only now that I can actually see that by the grace of God, and because I accepted the Bible, I accepted Christ, and now Christ has opened up my eyes, but it's not because of me. But, you know, if, that, if, if this conversation were to happen three years uh, ago, I would not be talking this way. I'd be singing the praises of Plato. Uh, but now I, you know, now I realize that this guy, man, he was – Platonics is, is evil. It's core. What, really Plato, is. <laughs> what, what Plato actually does is he leads you from one cave to another and not into the light. It's a good way of putting it. Now you know why uh, the priesthood, the ruling class of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, studies Plato. Why the the most revered theologians of the Roman Catholic Church, those who were regarded as the angelic doctors of the Roman Catholic Church, place so much emphasis upon Plato. Plato shows them, through this example alone, how to rule the world, how to deceive the whole world. And isn't that what the Bible says? That he's deceived the whole world? All the world wanders after the beast. They present to us a false reality, absent of any true light, but reflections of a false light. And who is that false light but Satan himself? Plato was nothing but one of the high priests of Baal, 
one of the high priests of Miss Babylon the Great. He was just a succession of all the philosophers from the ancient Babylonian uh, Empire through the Medo-Persian Empire and the Grecian Empire. And he's still one of the most influential sources of knowledge for the ruling class of the Roman Catholic priesthood. Revered by uh, people such as uh, uh, Bellarmine, a Jesuit priest, Bellarmine, and the angelic doctor, uh, who is his name? Thomas Aquinas. They were all Platonists in their philosophies. Absent any knowledge of the scripture, absent any recognition of the true light, and servants of the, of the false light, the high priest of Rome, the papacy. And this, this, this allegory of the cave just confirms, in my mind, all the more the diabolical nature of the Vatican, the diabolical nature of the Roman Catholic Church, and her control of the so-called rich ruling elite, the wise adepts of this mystery Babylon religion. And it's true, not many of those wise will enter the kingdom of heaven. The perdition is prepared for these deceivers. I agree, Tom, but on the other hand, there are a lot of people who are so satisfied with the illusion that they live in, that when you let them read this allegory of the cave, they at least can try to understand how deceived they are. Whether they go on the search for the real truth afterwards or not, is not in our hands. But even to tell people that they are asleep and they don't understand anything um, is already a step in the right direction. I mean, to me, everything that helps is good to wake people up. And when you see how vast the people are asleep, you know, when you want to feed them the truth, you cannot shovel it in them uh, with a big spoon. You have to give it part by part. Otherwise, they won't accept it. I mean, the, 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 the conspiracy that we are living in is so vast that when you've just awoken, when you've just opened your eyes, it is like you are looking into a 10,000-watt lamp. And what are you doing when you're looking into a 10,000-watt lamp? You will close your eyes immediately because you are blinded by it. So you have to take it part by part. And I always thought of this allegory of the cave of a part in the beginning to show people, look, the life that you think you are living is not the life that you live. So start to look around. And of course, to find the real truth, you have to leave the materialistic world and come to see the spiritual world that is behind it. And to see that the priests were always the men in power throughout the human, uh, the human history. And of course, they always abused their power. Because everybody knows the power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's what the priests were given. But for someone who is not awake yet to start with the allegory of the cave, to understand that there is, there is a deception anyway, I thought that was always a good entrance. But of course I agree with the rest of the teachings of Plato that they are um, from Satan and from, from uh, like what the Vatican teaches too. I agree with that. Well, after reading and analyzing Plato's uh, allegory of the cave, certainly now we can understand what was really meant by the cliché phrase that we've all heard, 
And here it is. All the world is a stage. Yes. Absolutely. That's, that's exactly what I meant. But, you know, people take these phrases that we say, like, oh, there's another phrase of this, and there's another phrase of that. They do not seek the truth behind that. They do not see that. I mean, there are so many eloquent people who made eloquent phrases. Uh, Lenin, Stalin, Hitler, uh, Voltaire. I don't know. I, I can't count them all. A lot of even Jesuits came out and, and, and said something that is really, really right. Like Churchill, who said history is written by the victors. Yeah, everybody knows that history is written by the victors, but they don't care to look for the truth behind that is hidden then by the victors. You know, they say, okay, I know that he said that. So what? Remembering that Plato existed some hundreds of years before Christ. Do you suppose that it was that it was Christ who had Plato in mind when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life? I am the way, the truth, and the life? It makes one wonder. It's very profound. Because... Because Jesus, because Jesus condemned, did he not, the philosophies of men? Who was he speaking of? Was he speaking of someone specific, like Socrates or Plato? Platonics was huge by then. Plato was like 450 years prior to Christ's coming. So, yeah. It makes and sense. How, much, wow. how much of Socrates and Plato's philosophies had contaminated... The, the the religious leaders in Jerusalem. That's amazing, Tom, that you saw that. Well, I am the way, the truth, and life. It's literally talking about that in the allegory, and you saw that. That's great. That's awesome. Because yes. it is there. Those elements are right there in this place. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That, that's what I meant when you seek the light. But, of course, they present just another light, or like you try to say, Plato is just putting them from one cave into another instead of to the real light. Exactly. Now, there's, a, there's a very interesting quote of Plato. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I'm going to quote it here, right here. Those who are too smart to engage in politics are punished by being governed by those who are dumber. Wow. And that's yeah. also something that he said. So if you take satisfaction with the illusion that is presented to you, even though you are smart, because you have a doctorate, you have studied five, six years in the university and whatever, and you are so smart, but you say, oh, politics. <laughs> no, nah, I don't go in there. Well, then you're going to be governed by people who are dumb. And what better example do you have than George W. Bush? Right? That's right. Who has true wisdom in this world? The children, even the children of the body of Christ have more wisdom than the wise men of the world. I think it's a call for liberation, don't you? I think, it's, I think I'm sick and tired of the really dumbest ones in the world ruling over the, the wise, the truly wise, the body of Christ. I think we should turn the tide on them. And we should make them the servants. That's a call for revolution. Yeah. And I'll tell you, that day is coming. The Bible in Revelation chapter 17 says, And these kings shall hate the whore. Yeah. And shall make her naked and desolate and eat her flesh and burn her with fire, for strong is the Lord that judgeth her. Where does all of our wisdom come from but the Lord? And that wisdom is going to turn the kings that now serve the papacy, the rich ruling elite that serve this false light in Rome, are eventually going to see the error of their ways. They're going to see the... the the, the tide of history changing in direction. And while all of, us, 
All throughout history, it has favored Rome. The kings of the earth have served Rome, have fought her crusades, have, have promoted her false light, given us a false perception of reality, are going to see us coming to the true light and the real wisdom and exposing all these false philosophers. And they're going to, like they always do with their fingers in the wind, they're going to see the change that Christ is coming his people are waking up. The body of Christ is beginning to, to move. And then they're going to turn on the source of all the deception in the world. It says, they will make her naked and desolate and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. The kings of the earth that have always served the papacy and this false messiah aren't going to turn on her. God hasten the day, but it's only going to happen when the body of Christ looses themselves from the chains, stop looking at the false reality being projected on the back of the cave, turn around and face the real light. Then the kings of the earth will see their error and God will use them to destroy her that's yeah, the way I see this like he has used um, the Jesuits in the past also with the General Blasquet 1798 to bring an end of the 1260 year reign of the Vatican yes don't all things work together for good to them that love the Lord? There still is only one in control, and that's uh, our Father in heaven. God has many times used wicked people to accomplish his ends. And those people who, the, who have served the papacy, the rich rulers of the world, he's, God's going to use them to destroy their very foundation. And it says that God will cause them to do this. All we have to do is stand up and accept our inheritance. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit to that last quote that uh, Tinder made on the stake before getting burned. He cried out, Oh, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. Yes. And not a year, just a year after he was burned on the stake, Henry VIII gave the first English translation Bible, the English Bible, to the people. And they could, for the first time, read the Bible in their own language. Even though it was translated from Latin, it was a beginning. Yeah. It makes you wonder, too, you look what Pope Francis and the what the Jesuits are doing with their propaganda right now, and everything that comes out of Pope Francis' mouth is is something you know that challenges this, you know, everything you know, including the beliefs, the, of the proclaimed beliefs of Roman Catholicism faith. So you look at him, he's he's supporting you know global warming. The gay marriage, evolution. He's challenging. Yeah, he's yeah in, in, in some, it could be in some way God is actually. We're, we're witnessing right now God actually the beginnings of destroying Rome. The credibility yeah. of, of Rome. The credibility mm -hmm. of the Pope. Yeah. That's why we ought to all be encouraged. You know, some time ago the Pope said. If someone is being gay, who am I to judge? And I thought by myself, well, you call yourself God on earth if you can't judge, who can? Roman Catholic <laughs> canon law, Roman Catholic canon law demands that the Pope is the judge of every man, and no man may judge him. This right. Pope, this Pope is bringing down the very foundation of the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, this, he, this Jesuit pope is tearing at the very foundation of the Roman Catholic Church, which is based 
on on the donation of Constantine and the and the and the the pseudo Isidorian decretals and the the infallibility of the Pope. And right. and I'm telling you, there are many Roman Catholics, and I've spoken to them directly, that that are are that just think it's a wonder that this Jesuit Pope hasn't been assassinated. Maybe maybe it goes even back to John Paul II when he in the year 2000 said his mea culpa, because this mea culpa is also indirect a way of saying I was wrong. Yeah. Because if you're not wrong for anything, you don't have to excuse yourself, right? The infallible church was admitting to John Paul II that Rome had killed to the tune of millions. But it was a very weak mea culpa because during his confession, his apparent confession, it was not a real confession, he weakened it by saying that in the past, in Roman Catholic Church history, a few of its adherents were a little bit too exuberant. But he failed to mention, he failed to mention that at the Third and Fourth Lateran Council, not just the papacy, but the ecumenical council, the, 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 the meeting of all the bishops, got together at the Third and Fourth Lateran Councils and said that the killing of heretics was a meritorious work. It wasn't only excusable, it was a way to earn grace. That it was no sin to kill a heretic. No, it was, only, it was not only not a sin to kill heretics, but it was a meritorious work. And this is where the the Inquisition came about. This is the the Roman Catholic canon law foundation of the Inquisition that burned untold millions at the stake, tortured them on the rack, crucified. You mentioned all the tortures and all the persecutions of the saints of the body of Christ throughout history. It was because of the Third and Fourth Lateran Council of the Roman Catholic Church that authorized all these killings. And yet, John Paul II, in making his so-called mea culpa, says, well, in our history, some Catholics were just a little bit too enthusiastic about their killing. Time for the world to wake up to reality. The very root and foundation of the papacy is to persecute and kill the saints of Almighty God. The earth is soaked with the bloods of the blood of the martyrs of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus because of the satanic nature of the papacy who believes he has the divine right to rule the world, not only over spiritual things, but over temporal things as well. And that John Paul II was able to deceive anybody in this world is simply because of the ignorance of God's people. Well, it's time to dispel that ignorance. I'm going to take a little break. I'll be right back. Okay. Michael, you got something else uh, to add here? Well, I was just looking at uh, Plato, Platonics, uh, and Demonurge, and the use of chaos. We always hear this chaos, uh, order out of chaos type of thing. And if you, uh, you're you going to look at Plato is involved in a lot with this, uh, you know, we hear Hegel's philosophy and Hegelian dialectic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it comes to, you know, a lot of what we see is just the same old things they've been doing for 2,000 plus years, 3,000 years. It's just being, you know, mastered and, and perfected as far as their control of the world. But, yeah, it's um, it's been an interesting conversation. I find I still can't get over the fact that Tom recognized uh, Christ's recognition of yeah, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No, and it's no. literally in the allegory of the cave. You know, literally it breaks it down that way. I mean, the story can literally be broken down that way. 
There is no other light than Christ in the truth. Yeah, that's it. But, you know, with the allegory of the cave, the eye is not Christ. It's man himself. So, and it's it's fascinating, too, because you you look at the order of chaos, and uh, chaos itself, and Greek, it, you know, it's talking about uh, Greek creation myth, the initial gap, the creation by the original separation of heaven and earth, and how the ultimate goal has always been that, a separation mm-hmm. of heaven and earth. In other words, uh, somehow getting rid of God. Let's get rid of the true and living God, and we'll just be our own gods. And it just the magnitude, all the the areas now that one can go to, I mean, from transhumanism to whatever, you know what I mean? There's so many things you can talk about when it comes to how the satanic system has it, it has been in play and go and is where it's heading to. So uh, it's been a real fun study. And I didn't expect it to go down this direction, but I'm glad it did. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's, well, we are not made for just um, worldly knowledge broadcasts. We always have to bring Christ into the equation. Otherwise, we can't be satisfied with what we're doing. No, but it's just been some amazing insights for myself and uh, what I've heard from you two gentlemen. So, and I have to tell you, I, I've had a mute uh, numerous times because I've just been laughing my head off some of the things you've been saying. And, um, <laughs> it's just, it has been quite comical, but also quite uh, profound. It's been a really profound conversation. So um, I, I don't know if, how many people will ever listen to this and recognize the truth that's been said to this past hour, but uh, I leave that in God's hands. But it's been uh, an interesting, very, very much an interesting hour. And uh, Plato is definitely in a different. I, I see him in a different light now. I was, uh, my attitude towards him has been changing over the year, but now I really see him in a different light. Who he really is. Who he really like, is. I, like I said in the beginning, he's uh, a little bit to be seen as the founder of humanism. And when you see what humanism leads to, only the destruction of humanity, then you have a very good view on what Plato was and who he dealt with and the way he dealt with the things. Yeah, he certainly he certainly had an agenda. Oh well, yeah, he did. He was he was serving himself and the elite at his time. So he wasn't he was not interested in the average person. He never was. And the more and more you study him, the more you realize that his teachings, the Neoplatonic teachings, are the foundation for fascism and communism and the Roman Catholic Church and the priest in modern day, or, you know, the, what did we know is the priest class. Mm. Uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's overwhelming how this philosophy has just influenced all our lives. And it's not just, you know, some guy, some distant character in the past that wrote an interesting story or two and had some philosophy to share. They really was speaking to the ruling elite. And how it is, how do you control the masses? And uh, once again, I'm being redundant, but I've heard so many people, including myself, sing the praises of Plato, and now, looking at him, there should be a, a, you know, a warning next to his name that he's not talking about you folks. He's not talking about the average man. He doesn't care about you. He didn't care about them back then. He's not the, the people that read and follow Platonics or Neoplatonic philosophy do not care about the average person. They don't care about God. They don't care about the the average citizen. They can only care about them. And Just like Satan. Yeah. The conclusion for the matter for me is that the allegory of the cave by Plato is simply the recipe for a global republic under a false Christ. Yeah. It's true. Oh my gosh, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more, Tom. <laughs> oh yeah. my God! It always astounds me how you can find the right words every time in the right moment. It's uh, oh, that's, that's a gift that you are blessed with, my friend. I think well, this, Tom, you know, he's you know, if you go back to the allegory of the cave, and someone actually has come out of the cave, and it actually is following the truth, it, the way, the truth, and the life. I mean, you come to this 
like you and I are coming to, you know, it's only been relatively recently that we've woken up to who the papacy is, who the Antichrist is, heck, who even Christ is, you know, who Jesus Christ is, you know. So it's, uh, yeah, to hear somebody who's walked, you know, a little further ahead of us and be able to put the pieces together, the puzzle together, um, it is really rewarding because it's, it's, it's so clear as day, isn't it? What's going on in the world now? I mean, it's the mystery is gone. You know the, uh, you know this whole thing, this Gnosticism, this you know I'll figure it out myself, or all the different ways that a man can go about trying to figure it out. You're still just chasing shadows. We no longer are chasing shadows. It's nice, isn't it, to be realizing your life you're no longer chasing shadows. It's really not quite nice. <laughs> we have come to see the true light of this world. Yeah. yeah. Now our responsibility is to free the rest of those who are fastened to the floor of the cave, in the back of the cave, and liberate them, bring them to the light, and teach them not only to tolerate the light, but to bask in the light. And that light is Christ. And then to collapse the entrance to the cave and leave all those behind who like to hide in the dens of the rocks. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, this is too profound. It's too profound what you just said there. That literally, uh, the Platonics has, has, a, has a huge influence on us, but we don't even realize it. Just what Tom just said, and now the Bible, that God's Word is exposing it. It's amazing. That was my motivation to read the allegory of the cave, because that leads to something more than just this uh, humanism and philosophy that he teaches when you have eyes to see and ears to hear. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to extend this broadcast over what it is. Uh, we are busy no. almost 50 minutes. I think we, uh, we are almost done. And uh, I thank Tom very much uh, for being a part of this. Tom, do you have any closing remarks? Because I know that I still do. Well, my thanks goes to Jesus and his mercy. And his grace. And thank you for the wisdom of the scriptures, the real wisdom of the world. And I'll close by saying, as I always do, bless blessings in the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago. I'll see you both next time. Talk to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for contributing here. Um, Michael, I, wa- I want to close with two little quotes. Um, The first one comes from the holy book, Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. End quote. That should put anybody into the idea of trying to get some knowledge or at least some spiritual wisdom and to close i want to say wisdom of the world can never understand divine matters with that closing remark i close up and i thank our lord and savior jesus christ and our father in heaven thank you father for this broadcast and that you led us all by the holy spirit that we could do this and looking forward to the next one by this Michael, see you next time. God bless you. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Okay, folks, uh, have a good day.